Hello, everyone. I'm Luc van Vliet, and I'm a Dutch visual artist working in the field of photography. My main focus is to visualize the experience of landscape. We have been uh, asked to work with the theme Perspective Through Details, and how can art describe the very search for a greater understanding through the science of details? Every new insight may change the way we see the world. And if the landscape is created through our culture, we can get new insights into our culture by looking at the world around us. The art can take the tiny details and through its way of seeing related to our day-to-day -day lives. So what is a landscape? A landscape meant a unity of human occupation, a jurisdiction even, and something that can be a good subject to paint. It's from the Dutch etym etymology of landschap, which is at the root of landscape. The essence of a landscape can be seen as partly nature, partly culture, and it's always connected and unified through the line of the horizon, how barely visible uh, even. So, landscape originates around the 15th century. This is probably the first painting where there is a landscape in the background. It starts as a background image. And it goes hand in hand with the invention of perspective. Also, uh, Piero della Francesca, who made this painting, is famous for that. But perspective is nothing more, but also nothing less, than one way of seeing and ordering the world. In my opinion, the photo, the photo camera is bound to perspective, and in my opinion, that's the biggest flaw of any photo camera. Because it doesn't take into consideration our perceptions of reality, and therefore I think that a camera can never show the world how we see it right away. In the first few weeks that we were here, we've had several meetings with different experts. And details from these meetings I've used to make a small collection of short stories. And it basically started all with patterns. So I've tried to draw Max 4. Um, and I had to think of height lines that you can see on maps from a mountain and the trees and the megaliths. And also oscillation like waves, but also a meandering river. And of course, the green thing we can see downstairs that if the neutrons are just getting a little bit lower in Max 4, they just bump it up a bit. And it goes up and down. So, electrons. electrons, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> electrons. Um, basically, circles, weights, and oscillation, and that could be a symbol of a possible circular way of living. I think it's something very useful in this era, where we have, since the Second World War, have been a constant focus on never-ending uh, GDP growth. And since the Industrial Revolution in farming, the uh, farming has taken industrial proportions. And something that's I don't know if it's typical for the Netherlands, but the youth gets more and more burnouts already in their 20s. So as if uh, taking any forms of breaks and any rest has lost all of its meaning, but I guess it is there in nature. A culture can be understood through its use of space. A landscape, I think, is built up of layers of soil, but also layers of memory and layers of knowledge. For example, a forest can be seen as a collection of trees communicating with each other, let's say for an insect outbreak, or as a border between safety and danger, or as a playground for battles of war, or as the original score on the landscape with Tundra Borealis, or maybe as the symbol of the world, as in, in the Yggdrasil tree from the ancient Edda. The paleoecologist and archaeologist Anna Bröström did excavations at the Science Village and the EASS site. She mentioned to us that most people think it was always farmland here in Skåne, but before that time it used to be actually a forest area. By looking at the soil, she could read how people had been living here through the study of pollen. And I could look at one of her soil samples that she had taken in the Avian Kingdom at the um, geology department in the University of Lund. This has resulted for me in creating a four panel, which I call a brief history of Skåne. And I've used the photographs of this soil sample as the basis of the soil in all four photographs. So it starts 9,000 years ago, when there is still a forest, or basically almost everything is forest here. 
And 6,000 years ago, trees are being cut down. It makes hunting easier and uh, people can get opportunities to hold cattle. And also farming might start. Ideas that actually originated in the Middle East. And 1,600 years ago, small-scale farming is mainly happening here. But there is still forest. And of course, nowadays, I think farming has taken up industrial proportions and I could just not, not see all the sugar beets when driving around here. But I guess we were at the good timing that they actually start to get them off the land. So what about the oscillation? I'm curious what will come next. I have some ideas, but I, I think there have been very hopeful insights into a more sustainable future. And I'm curious what that will reflect on in the landscape itself. Now let's get back to the idea of a forest. Because a forest can also be looked at differently. And I've stumbled upon this map, which is Magnus's map of Scandinavia from the year 1539. And by that time, the whole of Skåne was part of the Danish Empire. Um, and I was mainly interested in this forest area. Uh, here is Lund, so I guess it could be the Romalaysian Ridge. If, I'm, if you look at all the images, it's exactly in that same shape, but it could also be a little bit more up north. However, I was more curious into what that forest would look like then. So I tried to create an image of that. Previously, I guess I mentioned that um, with the invention of perspective, humanity tried to objectify the world. In the same period, actually map making came into being. So the, it's the start of geography and also the start of natural sciences and physics. All ways to objectify the world. So, what could this forest also look like? Might be looking like this. This is another place though. It is, it could have been in that forest area. And I took this photograph near Borstbecken and um, on March 25th, 1644, um, the Battle of Borst happened. The cruelties of war hit Harlösa by Borstbecken, a small creek a few kilometers to the east of Harlösa. 500 farmers tried to defend themselves against seasoned Swedish cavalry unit. The battle ended badly for the defenders who were killed to the very last man. And they found the remains of a lot of farmers in this area. Another way to look at the forest. Trees can communicate. Um, I learned from Ilva van Meningen that trees release so-called BVOCs, biogenic volatile organic compounds. The, these are trace gases other than CO2 and CH4, and they are produced and emitted by vegetation. Uh, in some ways, like let's say if a tree is cut down or is being hurt, it might release resin as a visible example of a um, uh, thing that it releases. It can also be visible um, above or through mountain ranges uh, with trees and that's why you sometimes have names like Blue Ridge Mountain. And the introduction of a doctoral dissertation starts with this short text. In the 1960s a plant physiologist named F. Wendt investigated the blue haze which often can be seen over various mountain ranges across the world. He concluded that this blue haze must originate from plants releasing submicroscopical particles as they are also called turpines. So I tried to take a photograph of a forest and because I always thought, and that is probably in this case the case, that it was atmospheric perspective. Droplets of water in the air that can be due to the big diff, uh, distance and then through the camera becomes a bluish tone. But even if this is just atmospheric perspective in this particular detail in this photograph, I have been started to look differently at the forest that they can actually communicate with each other. And I, I'm still flabbergasted that trees can actually let each other know that there is a, some insect outbreak that can happen. Now let's me get me to Max 4. One of the researches that is being done here amongst others by Karina Tanel, make me again look differently at the landscape. And I've taken a couple of the images that were taken 
uh, of seeds. And these are not the entire images. I actually combined a couple, so because it's part of research that was not published yet, so I've altered all the images. Uh, but basically, it was about zinc and cadmium. How is the um, uptake of these elements related in um, seeds? And um, basically, cadmium is bad for you and zinc is good for you. It's probably not that black and white, but that was the main thing that I took out of it. And it reminded me of some maps I had seen at the Geological Survey of Sweden. So... I have in the left a map of the area here where there is a lot of zinc. Okay, zinc is good. The same area, exactly the same, now with cadmium, because cadmium is bad. So I figured, well, what if I take the zinc map and remove all the areas that also contain a lot of cadmium and you get a new image. And then Mainly these places are left. A couple here, a couple here. This is, by the way, close to Schobo Kloster. This is close to Rögle Kloster, and this is near Ovets Kloster. Um, I guess maps are not objective because they are abstractions of reality. Certain things can be taken out, others are left in based on the reason for the creation of the maps. However, I think it's way more interesting than the satellite image of the same area. So. Now I'm looking here, so this is roughly near Schöbo, and then this area contains, or this area contains also a lot of zinc. So what do we see? Is there actually agriculture there? Is there forest there? I don't know. If I look at the, I can see that there is forest there, but what else is there? So I just went there and I took some photographs of the area. So it's a beautiful forest. There is a very nice creek, and you see how there is a lot of elevation in the landscape. And there is a stone quarry. And basically, that were the main three things that were there. Um, then again, it doesn't really say that much of the soil, but I had a very good excuse to visit this area. Let me get back to the seats, because there is something else that I thought was very interesting, and that is the pattern. So if I zoom really closely in, I had to think of a printing technique called silk screening, or at least digital silk screening, and I started to take a look at one of the photographs that I had taken here. I've deconstructed this image uh, based on light and color, and now again, you don't really see anything. You just see a pattern. You have to know what to look for. If I zoom out, it actually, you can already see some things. Now, I can do that with different colors. And I can put those colors back on top of each other. It almost looks similar. But now when I zoom in, I have this kind of. I guess it is still a work in progress. And I don't know what I will end up yet. I might end up with just those four photographs that I've made on the brief history of Skane and try to create silk screenings of it. I've never done that before, but it's something I will definitely go and try at home. This is the, just a digital um, experiment to show what that will look like. Um, I can also end up with more short stories and, and combine them all in a small kind of booklet. I don't know. So how does art describe the very search for a greater understanding through the study of details? I hope I've given some insight into my process. And I think our landscape and therefore our culture is shaped by the way we see the world. So I guess know your roots because rootless trees will fall. <laughs>